All right, so we're starting up week two of section one. So I kind of went over the class and I spent a lot of time with the Unity editor. We should probably make sure you installed everything correctly. So you should have installed, made a Unity ID, uh, made sure you got the personal edition. Um, that someone ran into that issue. Just so you know, in Unity Hub, you can go up to preferences and licenses and you can, if you pick the wrong license, throw it away and get a new one, a personal one. Um, under installs, you should have installed editor and you should have picked the most recent 2022. I'm going to be working from this one. Um, and if it's everything's okay, it should be loaded up looking like this. And the next step would have been to go to projects and new project. And um, we're going to start off in 2D and pick your location and name your project, maybe like platform or micro game. And then you have to pick a cloud organization. It's probably best to turn this off. You don't need these cloud services. It's not an issue if you turn it on, but it's like defaults to on. But you should create this project. It'll take a while. Um, and it will build an empty project. And then I kind of showed you the um, the asset store where the platformer is on. But it, you can shortcut it right here. Platformer micro game. And click open in Unity. And you'll get like a little pop up. Yep. So in, oh, where'd my hub go? Oh, no, lost my hub. So you mean in Unity Hub? Just give it a second. Um, oh, you don't have these right here? You don't have templates. So do you, do you have this up here, your editor version? Showing at least, like, do you have an editor that installed and selectable? Yeah. Um, if you click on any of these, do, does anything populate? No. If I click on project, it will show you a So that was showing you projects. No, it's okay. Um, so when you're in project view, if for some reason, oh, because I was sitting there. So in your project view, it'll show you all your projects you've already created. For you, it'll probably be empty. Um, or you might have a few, but we're uh, clicking uh, new projects and go to 2D. And name it, location, select a cloud org, which just is like your personal ID. All right, click create. And while that's like building an empty project, you pop over to the asset store, open this in Unity. And it'll be like a pop up saying, Do you want to open this in the Unity Editor or whatever? And you say, Yeah. And then you go back to Unity Editor and it'll be like, I showed you that little dialogue pop up. Um, but it goes like window package manager. So everything's being funneled through the package manager now, even all the asset store stuff. So you can go to packages and like my assets. This is like all the stuff I've downloaded from Unity Store over the years. Um, and it'd probably be easier for just me to say open Unity, open Unity Editor. And it will then, there it is. And you will, might need to download it first, but ultimately you're gonna to get to import and it'll say, hey, it's gonna override all your project settings, right? And you're gonna click import. And it'll give you this dialogue, like here's all this assets. Remember the project view is like mirroring your file explorer and all the assets are these external files that are coming in.
and sometimes there'll be dependencies on other packages and that's okay you can install upgrade and this shows like for me i've already installed it so it's like oh you're out, you're up to date there's no files that need to be added or updated but for you oh for example all these custom materials for whatever reason they materials they probably don't recognize it i have the most up-to-date version they're saying hey we want to overwrite them sure and a bunch of images and fonts and what have you and sound effects and sharp scripts and so you click next and everything it'll like load up in unity editor and you should get to here and then i was kind of breaking this all apart last class i was like picking i was going through all these game objects that compose our scene and kind of just giving you like an overview of what's happening and what all these game objects are doing. But the big gist is that project view gives you all your assets. You can right click here, show and explore, and here's your assets folder. These are all saved to the file disk and loaded up into memory as needed. And it's audio files and image files and 3D models and material files and, and shader, which are um, scripts and then C sharp scripts, which we'll be writing and others like prefabs and PDF docs and anything that builds your scene, right? There's a whole bunch of other stuff I kind of showed you. This is where the roots of my Unity project. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. This is actually the Visual Studio solution. This is why when you double click on the C Sharp file, it'll like load up your whole project and it'll actually, you'll be able to see like all your uh, C Sharp files and they'll all be like referenced in Visual Studio. And um, yeah, we have project settings and here's our packages, but really importantly is assets. These are, and they're all files and folders. Each have a corresponding meta file. Unity is managing this for you. Do not delete or move stuff around in here, do it in your project view. All right, and then um, everything is broken down into scenes. We have samples, this one just has one scene. Game objects are each major part of your scene. Think of it like level one, two, three. And each game object is broken down into component objects. And those give all the distinct behaviors and features on the game object. In this case, the camera game object um, has a transform. It needs to know its position in the 3D world, um, but it has a camera component, um, which makes it act like a camera so that the user, the player, can see into the game world and an audio listener to to play audio through the speakers or microphone or um, headset. Um, and every single component is a C-sharp script. Every component is coming from an asset. It's been copied from the file disk and put into memory. And it's all assembled with the game objects. Cool. Um, is anyone stuck? Along the way, is anyone still kind of journeying to getting their project open? Yeah, at least it, but it's open. You're opening a new project. Is anyone hitting a big stuck stop point? Cool. So uh, to me, it felt natural to continue this conversation with the player controller. Um, I don't want to go too high level and talk about like these game managers. Um, the player controller is usually kind of like the heart of everything because it's, it's managing the player for the user. It's managing the player avatar for the player user. So, and there's a lot of concepts we have, we're going to have to cover here as we kind of pick apart the script. But um, as we see the player here, we have the transform, which is its position, rotation, scaling information. We can press the W key and we can place the player anywhere. Although I think well, on start, we're going to probably get the spawn point and place the, the player right there. Um, the player controller, notice the icon is a C sharp script. In fact, if I right click on here, or if I just click on here, it'll bring me to the asset that's it's 
being um, instantiated from, it's being copied from. And so here we have the playercontroller.cs file. It's a C sharp script. The file um, you're going to think of as the class. When you write your code, you're writing the class. The class is like the blueprint, it's dead. It just sits on the file system, it doesn't go into your game. The type of um, object oriented programming we'll be doing is you write classes and objects get created from those classes. There is different styles of object oriented programming. Um, in, in JavaScript, it's very um, normal to just write the objects out and you can duplicate or not, but you're actually like just interacting and building objects directly. In C sharp, we're going to be writing the classes objects get created. So as many different instances of the classes we need. Controllers is an idea from object-oriented design where it's like it's controlling something or it's managing something. And normally there's like one of it. So we have one player controller, one like game controller because we just have one game, one player. But if it was a multiplayer game, we might write our player controller differently where we can create multiple copies, multiple objects of the player controller, um, and um, the, just the logic in it would be very different. So for example, we'll see that the enemy controller is written very differently than the player controller because we have many enemies and we have one player. And the enemies are controlled more by some AI logic where the player controller is waiting for user input from the keyboard or the mouse. Um, so here we see the folder. Um, this developer, whoever it was, decided to break their scripts folder up into different areas of the game. So we have the core logic, we have the gameplay logic, we have the mechanics logic, and model UI and view. So they decide to go with what are called a, an MVC, or a model view controller um, design. And we'll see it later in the code. I don't want to... Um, talk about it in detail right now. I'm just trying to show you that there's a folder structure and you're going to see some more structure of the scripts following this. Um, and MVC is uh, something that's very common in, in web programming and game programmers have uh, adopted it quite a bit as well. It basically means you have um, a model of, the, in this case, the game world, like all your details of the game world goes into the model. And then you have the view. What does it look like? So the view represents how do we like render it to the screen in this case. It, it can mean different things. But in this case, it's like the view of it. How do we look at our game world? And the controller is how do we control the game world? So the controller is usually user input coming into the controller, changing the model, changing the data in the model, which then the view must reflect. We must update the monitor and show it what changes have happened to the user. So you can see it's it's a it's an interesting design paradigm for for game um, programming because it it maps pretty well to it. So um, right now I have the player controller script, the asset, just the class, and it's showing like okay, yeah, there's a bunch of these exposed properties, which we'll talk about what this means. And it shows some of the details of the script, but we don't edit it here. It's just kind of showing the details of it. So it is on this player game object. Note that the player game object is blue. It, it's a prefab. Somebody built a bunch of parts of it and saved it out because they probably wanted to use it in different game scenes. And we have the player controller, which we're going to jump into in a second. But just note that there's other components, and we're going to have to interact with them pretty quickly. So we'll see that there is a sprite renderer. This is, um, we have this idea of a renderer. Something gets rendered to the computer monitor and sometimes it's a mesh renderer for 3D and sometimes it's a sprite renderer for 2D. And it's referencing the certain sprite asset, the actual image that's just sitting on our file drive, which in this case is a PNG file. And we have an animator. If I click on it, it's referencing this player animator, and we're going to get into this later. But it looks like there's many different states going on here. It looks like we have an idle, a landing, jumping, 
running, different ways to connect between these different animation states. Um, victory, hurt, death, and spawn. So we have quite a bit of animation states going on here. And that was under window, animation, animation, and animator. So um, we have some different animation states going on. We have a rigid body. In this case, rigid body 2D. But remember I said you need a collider to first um, interact with or be a part of the physics system in Unity. And so if I just click Edit Collider, we can view it. And it's just this little um, rectangle shape. Um, and it's a box collider 2D. And uh, a rigid body, which we'll see some of the physics code in the player controller, but it's set to kinematic. If you ever want to read up more on stuff, you can click the question mark. And it'll bring you to the Uni manual. Um, but to do more elaborate physics stuff, basically, instead of just like making it a collider, make it you want it to be moved. Kinematic means it's going to receive forces, and it might give forces off to other player on two other uh, physics objects, other rigid bodies. So it's allowed to receive and give um, forces. So we're going to give forces to it through user input to push it along. And sometimes it might hit or get, you know, get hit by enemies. But I think this is all like a very basic physics setup, if I remember, in this game project. And we have an audio source, which looks like the player controller will like pass in different audio files to play based on the different states of the player. And we have a health script, um, probably manages if he's alive or dead, and the collider. Cool. So that was all the components that we'll have to cover. But for now, I want to spend some time in Visual Studio. Um, so notice how I was able to just double click on either this script reference here is actually referencing the script file. So you can double click here or you can double click on the script asset. But in either case, the, the behavior should be, it should load up Visual Studio for me. If it's not doing that, um, we're gonna have to spend a little bit of time talking about how to connect Unity to Visual Studio. Some of you will have issues, but until you like load up Unity, and get an empty project and and bring in the platformer assets and everything. You won't know if there's issues yet. So hopefully when we leave toward the end of this class, you can test out this whole pipeline and, and, and see if something's broken for you and we're gonna have to cover it in class. Is anyone experiencing any issues right now? Cool. <clears throat> Visual Studio, this is the community edition. It's for free. I am logged in. You can create a Microsoft account. It's for free. It'll prompt you to log in. You don't have to. Um, some of you love VS Code if you're in other programming classes. There is a Unity plugin for VS Code. It's not covered in this class. I'd prefer if you just use Visual Studio community. And in fact, if you go up into Unity and go to edit, and preferences and external tools. You'll see that I'm connected to Visual Studio here. And if you're connected to VS Code or, or just like a default text editor, this is one area you can look at like, oh, I should really be connected to Visual Studio instead. Um, so this is what C Sharp code looks like. Yeah, it looks pretty good on the monitors. Um, notice at the top I have different tabs. So I was already opening up, but these are all um, CS, C Sharp files that um, are in the same project. We're going to be focusing just on player controller for this class. All right, so on the left-hand side, we have numbers. These are the, the line of code number. It's going to be, um, it's like a very elaborate text editor. So you need to know like what line of code you're on. In this case, this, this um, file is like about 150 lines of code. That's about pretty normal, like 200, 300, 400. It, each CS script is supposed to be like a little modular piece of functionality. It's not supposed to be like this uber monolithic part of the game. So you're not supposed to get up to like several, like thousands of lines of code. 
maybe in some situations, but they're supposed to be broken up into little scripts that are easy to understand at a moment's notice. So usually at the top, we have some using statements. This just means that we're referencing other code files, other um, areas that contain a lot of um, CS um, script files. So libraries, they, they contain a, um, a bunch of CS files. So here we see that there's like some system.collections. Now this is coming from C sharp.net. This is coming from actual like the operating system. Um, and we'll definitely, right now they're not highlighted. That means we're not referencing anything from those code libraries. Uh, but we will be referencing them when we have to make like lists. Um, and you'll see them like, I'll show you when they get highlighted. But these are highlighted. These are, we are referencing them in our code. So Unity Engine always kind of comes along for the ride, and we, we're always going to reference it now just because we're making scripts that are meant to interface with Unity Engine. Um, and I'll show you when it's being used down here. Now, this developer decided to break up their code into namespaces, um, and it might be a little bit complicated for a beginner, but... Um, I'm going to have to go through what this means. So it means that um, they decided to place this code in a namespace. So this player controller script is within platformer.mechanics. So if we go down into scripts folders, notice that there's a mechanics folder. So everything in the mechanics folder, if I click on them, notice they're on namespace platformer.mechanics. This is just a convention that this developer chose to to use to organize all of his scripts. And if I jump over to say the gameplay folder and I click on the script, notice it's in namespace platformer.gameplay. So he's just nicely placed their, um, their scripts in, in each namespace into each folder so it's easy to like find stuff. So if I'm in the mechanics namespace and I ever wanted to reference the scripts that are sitting in those other folders that are that this developer put into those namespaces, you have to say using because he purposely broke them out into namespaces. There is like a big generic global namespace. So if you don't define a namespace, which is the state, like when you create a script, usually it, you're not defining a namespace. It just goes into global. Like you can access whatever's in global. Um, and I'll point this out, like what, it's, what other scripts are referencing. But notice that we do have access to model, core, core.simulation, gameplay. And we'll see like where they're being used. So right off the bat, we're saying, hey, this script we're making is going to exist in the mechanics namespace. And it, so it's like when you say go to a website, and you go to www.google.com or something like that. And there's like www saying we're going to be referencing something in World Wide Web dot. We're going to be referencing something called Google dot. So it's that same type of like namespace goes down through the dot syntax. You get like deeper. It's like subfolders. Folder, folder, folder. Cool. Um, so when you see double slash or triple slash and this green, this, these mean comments. So there's single line comments and multiple line comments, but comments are just little notes to yourself and other people. They don't actually, it's not code that actually runs. You'll see like when you go back to your code after like a week or so, you like forget stuff. So it's, sometimes it's good naming conventions is important, but sometimes you just have to put some comments in. So this person is putting in some comments. Um, these are more like advanced comments when you when you see this like triple slash and you see these like little arrow brackets, but when just basic comments is you can write stuff after some slashes. So notice this namespace opened up and there's a curly bracket. I'm gonna minimize it. And notice the whole rest of the file is in that namespace. So um, I'm gonna open it back up with that kind of dot 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 or the plus, but here we have a curly bracket and everything underneath it is indented, one tab, which means everything is contained in that scope. 
it's contained in that namespace. So if I go all the way down to the bottom, here's the ended curly bracket. So it's saying everything from left curly bracket to right curly bracket, I own it. It's in my scope. It's in that namespace. Now we come down here. We notice um, the first real line of code that comes afterward. That's one tab in owned by this namespace, and I'll minimize it. Everything is within this class. This class is called player controller. And I'll open it back up. And it too has a curly bracket. It has a scope. So it's like saying, hey, in this file, we have this one namespace. And within this one namespace, we have this one class. So usually one class per file is usually the convention with Unity scripts. Um, and usually that main class is called whatever the name of the the file is. So notice it's called player controller and notice the file name is called player controller as well. Now as, as I hover over it, you know that you're in good shape with um, the Unity plugin for Visual Studio. If you start getting these nice little hints. So this one is saying, hey, this is a class. It's in the platformer.mechanics namespace. So it's platformer.mechanics.playerController. All the way at the end is the, the file name, so, you know, like um, appended to the namespace. And then it gives you some description. This is the main class used to implement control the player, blah, blah, blah. Notice that's the same thing. That description is the same as that comments above it. So this developer, the way that they wrote the comments, we'd use these triple slashes and that summary and then end summary with the, that slash, it's used as part of the definite or the description of what this class is. So, you know, they're like um, doing something a little sophisticated and they're using their comments to make a description for um, this IntelliSense. All right, so it's a public class. Public meaning anything other, other classes can access it. We're gonna get into what public, private, and protected mean. But just know that um, when a class or an object is public, another type of class, another type of object can access it. If it's private, they can't. So normally your one class is public because all your other scripts want to kind of talk to it in some way. And some parts of it are public and some parts are private. And then we'll, we'll talk about when, usually by default, you want to keep stuff as much stuff private because you don't want everyone else messing around with it. Because um, you might change stuff that you didn't mean to change and break something. So um, I'll get into classes and objects in a little bit. Notice we have this um, colon, and this is inheritor operator. And it's saying that player controller class is inheriting from kinematic object. So we'll dive into this more, but if I right click on it and I could say go to definition. I can open up the kinematic object file, the kinematic object class. And I'm not going to dig around in here too much. I'm just going to say that all this code comes along for the ride. This is inheritance. This is a big concept in object-oriented programming. So the developer decided, hey, I'm going to have quite a few things that are kinematic objects. Kinematic meaning they're, they're movable. They can be updated by the physics system. And maybe there's like players and enemies and pickups or back, I don't know, um, level elements, whatever. I only want to write this code once. I don't want to write it over and over again. So I'm going to write all this like base code and what it means to be a kinematic object. And I'm going to have other stuff inherited. It's almost like a copy and paste. Like copy this right into my class. But what I wanted to show you is that, well, this class is inheriting from something as well. And usually this is as high as you get, mono behavior. This is like the end-all, be-all Unity class that everything inherits from. So when you inherit from mono behavior, you get some special, um, some special abilities. Your script can become a component object. You can drag it from project onto the um, one of the scene objects and make it a component. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that in a second. I'll create a script and show you. Just drag it on. But there's a lot of code in here that we're inheriting. But this is the end of the road. We're not in, there's not another step up. There's not another class I got to go investigate. I know that 
everything inheriting from this is mono behavior. So player controller is a mono behavior. So the beauty of the mono behavior that you have everything inherent is I'm just going to go to the root of scripts and I'm going to create a C sharp script. I'm just going to call it something. Uh, it doesn't matter what, but just to make your life easier, don't just take that name because then you have to kind of change your class. Because remember the class name needs to be the same as the file name. So I'm just going to call it something right now before the file gets created. I'm just going to call it test and press the enter key. Now this is just a basic C sharp script. I'm going to double click on it. This is what it looks like. We have some using statements. Notice using Unity Engine is highlighted. It's actually being used. Where is it being used? Well, test is inheriting from mono behavior. Whatever this C sharp script is called mono behavior that some Unity developer wrote. And if I hover over it, it says this is the base class that many Unity scripts derive from. So notice we get some methods put in here. So the class starts here in this curly bracket and it ends here and everything within it belongs to this class. Everything within it will get copied as we make component objects of it. So just by default, we get a start method and an update method. A method is a function that belongs to a class or an object. Now, what does the, the structure of a method look like? Um, well, usually there's a name. And usually the name begins with a capital letter. And if there's multiple words, they'll be like camel case. There's no spaces in between them. It's just capital letters for each word. And usually has these, these parentheses, these smooth brackets afterward. Right after it says, this is my input parameters. So this defines it as a, a function or a method. Right now, these input parameters, the smooth brackets, are empty. Nothing is coming in. We're not expecting any input. We're just going to run this method. And the start method and the update method, and there's more I'm going to cover, but they're all inherited from mono behavior. So start means whatever this method is, run it once, right at the beginning, right when the game starts. And then update means call it every frame. Now, a frame is an idea that... Um, we call the update method as many times as we can per second. So a frame is just like a little fraction of a second, but it's variable. So depending on how much code you're running in your game, depending on the hardware that it's running on, if it's like an older hardware, if it's mobile hardware, and you have a lot of logic in your update loop for all these different game objects, it's going to take a lot longer to go through one frame, one update frame. So your frame rate will be lower. Maybe it's like 10 times a second, 15 times a second for poor performance, but you want to try to keep it around 30 frames per second um, and up. And the reason for that is it's also tied to rendering. So I'm sure you've seen like when games get clogged up and like things kind of move, kind of glitchy. That's because there's too much going on and the computer can't run through all the frame, can't run through all the update code and it's slowing things down. So the only reason you want to make sure to keep your frame rate above 30, keep your update loops light, is because players don't want to see that glitchiness. So um, a frame is variable, but normally we talk about 30 frames per second, 30 frame rate, one divided by 30. And um, the reason we say that is because people get tricked into seeing motion usually past 15 frames per second. And so to ensure a smooth frame rate, we like to stick around 30. For VR, it's usually up like 60, 90, 120. And if you've ever seen Hertz, like, oh, my God, I bought a TV and it's 120 Hertz. Hertz is the refresh rate. That's the frames per second. Um, so anyway, that's a frame. The idea of a frame the idea of the update loop or the um, update method, it's super important. Um, and you're given this by default because normally you use it all the time. <clears throat> um, but there are other um, events. So inheriting from mono behavior gives you access to all this. 
actually, real quick before I go into events, the main thing that um, I want to show you is that when you create a C-sharp script and it's inheriting from mono behavior, you can click on a game object and you can drag your C-sharp script onto it and it will make a component object of your C-sharp class, make an instance of one object that sits as a component object, a modular piece of functionality on your game object. And I'm just going to remove that for right now because it's not doing anything. So notice I can go to remove component and pull my script, my uh, component off that game object. So since we're talking about events, um, I put these two links up here, um, Unity events execution order and Unity events function details. So these are all the Unity events you get when your C Sharp class inherits from mono behavior. So um, initialization, when you first click play, when the user first starts your game, um, awake is first called. So we have awake, on enable, start are super important. Awake means like this component, this script component, this object of my class just became awoke. It just started up. You can start up and turn it off. So like in when a game is playing, you can turn stuff on and off. You can enable it or disable it. You can put it to sleep. You can wake it up. And what's really happening is, oh, there's these special methods that you call when you want to wake it up or disable it. And you could put code into it because you're inheriting from mono behavior. So there's this initialization step when the game first runs. Um, and then there's this start sequence uh, normally it's like oh you got to connect up all your references you got to make sure all your other scripts knows about everything else because you're going to start calling everybody so it's like setting everything up setting the game up putting your dominoes up getting ready for the player to knock them down so next we have fixed update so we're moving out of initialization and we're moving into the frame we're moving into this idea of update so fixed update has to deal with physics Fixed update is not variable. Physics calculations can't be done willy-nilly, like, oh, whenever we get access to it, we're going to run our physics. It's very, it needs every, like, a very, I think it's like 0.02 seconds or something. I forget what the default setting is in Unity. But you can create the fixed update method, and you can put, like, code that relates to your rigid body or something about physics on your component script. I'm not going to go into details, but like if we get talk some more about physics, maybe some more about these other states might become prevalent. But all you got to see is fixed update comes before update. So input events, game logic, that type of stuff goes into the update method. So if you're, you keep checking for, hey, did the user click the left key? Did the user click the mouse button? Did they click the mouse button? You never know. So in the update loop, you keep checking. You know, did, did they click a mouse button? Did they press the left arrow? If so, we're going to move the character left. Uh, did they press the space bar? Okay, we got to jump the player. This is the type of stuff you do in the update loop. And it's run as quickly as possible. Um, and it's great for checking for user input or running game logic. And then we have late update. This is called at the end of the update frame. So for usually for beginners um, or, or basic uh, game coding, you don't really need access to late update, but you'll, if there's ever a situation where you're like, hey, this, this component needs to do something, and it needs to do something after everybody else has done their update frame, has done their update loop, then you put code in that late update. So it comes in useful sometimes. Here's a bunch of uh, screen rendering not going to get into it. Gizmo rendering, like drawing gizmos on UV editor. Um, on disable and on destroy are, are some, something interesting. Not when the game quits, but if you're like destroying a game object, you might want to do some cleanup logic. Um, if you're disabling it, but it's still active, and maybe you're going over to another game scene, or maybe you're pausing and you just want to disable some activity. You want to disable the enemies until the player is ready to 
be in active play mode again, you might call stuff on the disable and turn stuff off. Um, so anyway, this is a great page to read through. I just wanted to introduce you to the main Unity events and you get access to them by creating their methods uh, in your class that's inheriting from mono behavior. And the next page that um, I put up in the links was this event functions. This just goes into details like what does the update um, event look like, the update loop. So void update, and then here's some logic that you might put into it. Here we're, we're calculate, oh, is the user pressing left or right? If so, we're going to calculate the speed, the amount of distance that they moved, and we're going to update the transform. We'll get into this stuff later. And then fixed update and late update. And we're going to have to get it to collision events. They're going to happen a lot in physics. Cool. Um, so I'm going to take a brief pause before I go back into Visual Studio. I know that was a lot. And is anyone able to get up and going? I just finished. Now you gotta, I'm just gonna take a little drink. And if you're at a, a part where like you can add in the, the 2D platformer or whatever the next step is in your process. Yep. I haven't even noticed how the I have a weird visual picture. Okay. Hold on one second. Oh, like pink? Yeah. Yeah. I need to show it. But in like game scene and I try to play the game, everything is off. Start moving the top of the. Yeah, you updated graphics card recently? I mean, I also tried to just check if the updated graphics card was restart Unity. Anyone else? All right, I kind of have to front load you with just a lot of concepts or theory to get up and going. It's, you know, it becomes more back and forth later on. But that was a lot. Just checking if there's any chat. And just take a moment. If anyone has any questions, if they're able to move forward and getting the gaming project up and going. Let me check the time. Okay. It's been 50 minutes. So I might start winding down. I don't want to lecture the whole time. But what I really want to make sure is that your gaming projects are functioning. You can open up the code in Visual Studio. You can start playing around. I'm going to do a few more things, or at least you can like start screwing around with player control and script. So maybe this stuff is more grounded. You're not um, you're not supposed to be just listening. You're supposed to really start breaking stuff and seeing how stuff is pieced together, and the concepts are supposed to sink in better. Um, let me see, let me guess, let me think about where, I, like, before you leave today, so class is going to end in, like, 30 minutes, and you really need to 
have created the project, have brought in the, the platformer assets, um, have clicked play, confirm you can move the player around, um, clicked on a C Sharp script and open it up in Visual Studio, make sure your IntelliSense and Unity plugin is working in Visual Studio. Like, you can function. Because I, I want you to leave class here where you could just, like, mess around with... Um, mess around with some of the settings here in player control. Like I got to explain what these properties are that are being exposed. And at least you can change these numbers and see how it impacts gameplay. And so at least you can have something to do before Friday. Yeah. Uh, all right. I don't, I don't know. Let me see. Sometimes, let me unclick the viewer, I think. I just click play again. Sometimes there's these like one off areas where you can clear them out. So again, I just want to make sure you stay in here. Make your cloud projects. Yeah, even if you have like a really nice desktop at home you're working off of, just kind of make sure your laptops are working or you just want to work from home, you don't have to just send it away. But yeah, make sure your laptop's working. Yeah, we're not going to use the solution explorer, but if you were close to that, do the self search things. Usually this gets pulled out of the See, this like tells you more errors and stuff. If you really want to maximize. All right. How's everyone online? Any questions? No. Cool. So let me keep going so I can get to what this stuff is that's exposed in the inspector so you can mess around with it. So this is a class, it's called Player Controller, inheriting from Kinematic Object. And now we have um, some stuff here. And underneath it is an awake method, an update method, some other method called update jump state, another one called compute velocity, and an enum. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cover this today. I just want to show you the structure of this script. So it looks like we have a bunch of methods, like four methods at the bottom. And at the top, what are called variables. Um, sometimes you call them fields. Sometimes you call them properties. It depends how they're exposed. So let's just go through them one by one here. So we're saying um, we have a public variable of type audio clip called jump audio. 
So every time you declare a variable, you have to give it a name because if you want to reference it later on, you use the name to reference it. And the variables have to have a type. So these are all objects. These are all classes. So the primitive types you should be familiar with, those are integer, uh, float, which is just a decimal number, um, booleans, true or false, strings, which is text, um, and here we have some classes that a Unity developer wrote, and this class is an audio clip. Somehow it manages uh, an audio file, but we want to reference it, so it's a container for audio data. Great, and there's three of them. So there's three variables of type audio clip, and we'll look at what these types mean, but in this case, it's coming from Unity Engine. Some really experienced developer wrote it, and it has to deal with managing audio. That's great. But we have three variables called jump audio, respawn, and ouch. And when they're public, the interesting thing with um, Unity scripts is when you make these variables at the top of an object, at the top of a class, when they're public, they're known as properties. They're exposed. You can tweak them. Something else can tweak them. So if I go back to Unity, um, notice it was jump audio, respawn audio, and ouch audio. They're exposed into the inspector. So it makes for a really easy assignment, referencing. So these three are referencing these audio files down here in the project view. So I can right click on here, um, or if I click on this little circle thing and say none, it says none, saying, hey, this is a public property. It's being exposed out um, through the Unity Spectre and nothing is referencing it. Who is uh, Jump Audio? I'm expecting it to be an audio clip. And you can click here and it'll go into your assets, into your project view. It says, hey, here's all the files that are of the type that are make sense with an audio clip variable. And, it, and all these audio files are waves, but the, <clears throat> this one is an AIFF. There's other audio files like MP4s or OOGs. But in any case, these are all compatible audio files that can be wrapped up into an audio clip object. And you can drag them. You can also say, okay, I want this file. I'm going to drag it and drop it. You're doing a reference. It's super easy to do through the inspector because this is a public variable on this object, and, the, it's, and it's, that's the term that we use called a, a property. So notice that there's other properties. So here's three of them. And if we come down here, we have a public uh, property called float, um, type float called max speed, and it's set to seven. And notice how each line of code ends in a semicolon. So in C Sharp and a lot of strongly typed languages, you have to designate the end of the line command with a semicolon. And then notice we have a summary here. And if I hover over it, it'll have that same description there. So it's saying, hey, this is the maximum horizontal speed of the player. Great. So if I jump back over here, max speed was defaulted to 7. So we have this idea of um, declaring a variable and assigning it. So when you declare a variable, it's actually this first part saying, hey, I am going to have a variable. It'll be of type float. It'll be called max speed, and it'll be public or private. Um, but notice it wasn't, a, um, it wasn't assigned a variable. It wasn't assigned a value. It was just declared. So this idea of a variable declaration, and we have an, at some point it needs to be assigned, but it doesn't need to be assigned right away. But usually we default it to something. If you don't assign it, it's going to get defaulted. For a float that's zero, an int at zero, a bool, um, a bool is is true, I believe, uh, and a string is just an empty, is just an empty string, just quotes from nothing in. But this person said, okay, I'm going to default it to a speed of seven. This programmer said that, right? But if I go back, notice that somebody must have clicked play in Unity and, and tested it, 
and said, whoa, seven's too fast. I'm going to change it to three. Now, that's why there's a seven in the script and a three over in the Unity inspector. So the seven came first. It said, hey, I'm going to default this variable seven because that's my best guess. I know it's definitely not zero. But somebody tested it. Maybe the developer or maybe another person on the team, maybe a designer. And that's the beauty of um, exposing it in the inspector is other people who don't understand code, your teammate, can very quickly change the settings to what they like. So this is a max speed of three. I can ramp it up. And let's go back this one, seven. So somebody must be like, no, 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 that's just insane. This isn't going to work for me. And they ran it down. You know, this is, oh, well, this isn't still it's too slow. So, a lot, you know, designer, tester, somebody said, all right, three feels like you did. Now, notice when I unclick play, that 3.12 popped back to three. So this is another important idea with, you need to decided to have these public properties expose them to the inspector because it's super easy for people to tweak them. But during play mode, you can like tweak a whole bunch of stuff, change stuff, and not really be aware of what you're changing and why. And so when you unclick play, it defaults back to whatever that variable was set before you clicked play. So you kind of have to remember, be like, okay, I did my play testing and I really liked it at four. So I'm going to update it to four. But notice now when I update it, when it's not playing, I click play. I say, okay, let's ramp it up to 15. Looks like Superman. It's turned off. It goes back to four now, not three, because I changed it when it wasn't playing. So definitely have fun with changing all these numbers or changing sound effects. So, for example, jump. So if you want to turn off the music, just go up to the game controller and turn off that audio source. But here's the jump sound. But if you don't like that, if you're tweaking it, whatever, uh, try, I don't know, land on ground. Yeah. It's playing something else, land on enemy. <laughs> sure. But I'm testing it. Hey, I like it. I don't like it. Whatever. Unclick play, and it pops back to whatever the settings were before play. All right. Um, okay, I want to hover over max speed just real quick. No. So you can have other tips that, pop, like they call them tool tip, if you want this stuff to pop up for tips for the. Um, Whoever's changing the specter, you could do that, but nothing's on. Um, so jump takeoff speed is a float. Now, this is an enum. I'm not covering this in class today. Maybe I'll get to it Friday. So a bool, straightforward, is true or false. And some of this stuff isn't meant for you to tweak. So like grounded and um, what was the other bool? Oh, that's private. Okay, so this is private. Stop jump. If this isn't exposed out to the inspector, nobody could tweak it. Only the object itself can tweak this because it's private. So now that we're talking about this, when we have variables declared at the top of an object, public is known as properties. Properties are changeable, customizable. And if they're private, they're known as fields. The field you could think of as like a piece of data that's owned by the object and no one else can mess around with it. And um, there's other ways to expose um, fields and stuff. But we have this idea of properties and fields. What is exposed and not exposed. Um, so when stuff is exposed publicly, either it's meant for you to assign assets to it, like what is the audio file? Or like, who's the health? Um, notice that these down here are none. They're not assigned. And now notice when I click play. Um, 
they do get assigned. And they're assigned to the components of the same object. So this was a, technically I don't think they need to be public because what's actually happening is on awake, it's saying, hey, I'm a component on this game object, me, this script object, me, player controller. Go get me component health, go get me component audio source, Collider 2D, sprite render, animator. So it's saying go out onto this game object here and go find me this, the sprite render, go find me the animator, go find me the rigid body, because I'm going to reference, I'm going to call stuff on it later on, because I'm the player controller, I'm in charge of all the components that make the player. So awake, here's a great instance of awake, when this component object awakens for the first time, go out and hunt on this game object and find me these components. So get component of type. And we have to, I'll, I'm not going to talk about this in class, but these are known as generics and what this means. I'm going to stop for now. Um, yes. I have a question about the last Yeah. Um, it is changing in the code. Um, so max speed defaults to seven, just like right now it's hey, seven. But if somebody decides to change it here, it will change max speed. And we have to look at how max speed is being used um, <clears throat> in the script. So later on, I'm going to go through... So this tells me where this variable is being used later on in the script. So it's saying here, 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 which is these that it found. It's being used here, and it's being used here. But I've yet to go through the code. But yeah, it is. When you change it in the inspector, and it reference it and say, hey, it used to be seven, but now it's three, but somebody's changed it to four and a half. And when it does these calculations in the update or the fixed update, it does go, it does reflect. Yep. But I'm, I'm not, yeah, we'll cover that on Friday. Or, but I'm done for tonight. But, um, is there any other questions about what I covered? Now you can just go around and mess, at least you can go around and mess around with player controller properties. Um, and make sure your project is live, updated, working. All right. Cool. I'm going to stop the lecture unless there's any questions about the lecture.